So, I think, or not. In any case, I mentioned this morning we are really honored to have people who've come both a long way physically here, but especially out of... You're here already? Yes. You're here? I haven't called you yet. I was told to come up. Oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. We do I know each other a little again. bit. Don't worry, don't worry. That's it. We both used to do stand-up comedy, but there you go. Anyway, just come on stage. Please welcome from Washington, D.C., Grover Norquist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're not the most comfortable things. They're kind of like these, and now I'm going to sing you a song from my latest album. And at our height, they're way too high. Anarchy versus democracy. One of your <clears throat> great quotes. I want government so small we can drown it in a bathtub. Yeah. Now, how's that, don't get personal, how's that gonna work? I mean, to kind of paraphrase John Lennon, imagine there's no government. How on earth is that gonna work? Well, two things. One, I'm not arguing for anarchy, although I, so, I see that's the vote. Uh, <laughs> arguing for limited government. Uh, arguing for the government, a competent government, to do a few things well. Look, as society gets more complicated, as technology gets more complicated, you need fewer rules. Not more rules, you need fewer rules. And you need rules that anticipate that things are going to change, not lock everybody in and say, this is the way we've all been doing things. We've got serfs, now here are the rules for serfs. Well, what if people don't want to be serfs anymore? What if we're going to shift to free labor? None of your rules fit anymore. So you need to have uh, a limited number of things the government does, uh, and then after that, it should get out of the way. Getting out of the way, okay, but who's gonna make, I mean, we heard that great quote from uh, Chubba, well, Chubba quoted Churchill just before, which, as I just said to him, thank you for reminding me of the quote I was about to use, that democracy is the worst form of government apart from everything else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was looking, we've got, uh, we had in the UK last month uh, a vote for new London mayor, and the new mayor got 1.1, I think, million votes, and that was out of a population in London of about 9 million. Now, okay, is that democracy, or how does this work when we had a turnout of 40-something percent? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if we, if we didn't have that, what would we have in its place? You know, we have to accept that there is some government, as you've just said. Sure. Uh, when you only get a, a limited number of turnout of people, is that going your way, or how does this, how does this work? No, there's a challenge here, because we're saying anarchy versus democracy. Anarchy is what the government does. In anarchy, it does nothing. But in limited government, it does a limited number of things. In socialism, it does a great number of things. Uh, and so how many decisions do you get to make, and how many decisions does the government make for you? That's one question. Democracy versus monarchy versus aristocracy is how do you pick the guys who run the government? Okay? Uh, you could have a, a situation in Hong Kong where it's completely undemocratically picked by some British guy who said, you're the head of Hong Kong. But he did very few things. And they had a very open society compared to other alternatives. They didn't have a lot of rules. But it wasn't democracy. On the other hand, you can have a democracy in the United States in, in many cases where uh, when they set it up and people voted, representative government. Um, and the government didn't have a lot of rules. Uh, so, and a monarch could either be a monarch who leaves everybody alone, or a monarch who's a, a thug and makes all the decisions for everybody. So how you pick the, guy, the people who run the government is one issue. What that government does is another issue. I think democracy is a pretty good way of keeping the government from getting too thuggish. Okay. Not a complete protection, but better than monarchy. <laughs> OK. So uh, I'll come back to some. Um points you've made in, I mean, you're, you're from, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like the heart of the Washington Beltway. Right in the middle. Washington, right in the middle. You're, yeah, Washington, no, but, D.C. I don't mean physically, but you, you yeah. and your, your role since, what, the 80s? You said you went to Washington, Washington with, with Reagan. Yeah. And I was reading somewhere that, um, yeah, you want smaller taxes, small amounts of taxes and government. Uh, but then there was the point where you didn't want some um, allowances, um, or you wanted some allowances removed, so that there was a, 
uh, instead of some um, like credits for people, oh, tax, credits. tax credits, for example, that mm -hmm. um, you wanted those removed in order to reduce the taxation. I'm, I'm curious about that because when you, is that not a form of kind of support or that you actually take away support for people and leave them in a worse case? How, how do you see that? Because my logical, can be correct, incorrect thinking behind that is if you're removing support for some industries and some people, okay. that money's got to come from somewhere. If industries close down because they're not being supported, probably those industries will exist in another country. Therefore, people who want those goods have to import those goods. The price goes up and everybody's worse off, even though the initial intention is good of reducing the taxation base. Is that a kind of argument that... I think you're talking about targeted tax credits for a particular industry? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take 20% of everything you earn, but you, industry over here, because you're important or we like you or you're a nephew of the governor, um, we're going to give you a tax credit uh, so that you don't pay as much in taxes. I, I think that's very, very dangerous and, and is always open to corruption. Uh, you may say we're going to get, uh, in the United States, Solyndra got a tax credit uh, because they were going to be solar energy, or, uh, but then they also got a tax credit because they were giving money to the politicians who decided that they were, uh, needed a tax credit. It almost always ends up being bought and sold. So those sort of, that favoritism I think is a mistake. Better to just say instead of having a 20% tax rate and special deals for the president or the senator or the governor's friends, uh, relatives, uh, you should see everybody's at 18% and no special deals for anybody. Even if you've got a really, really, really good reason, because all corruption starts with a really, really, really good reason. <laughs> I remember a quote, I, I thought it, and it could be from Clint Eastwood of all people. Um, actually, you were called Clint Eastwood. I, I saw a quote of, you were called the Clint Eastwood of, what was it, of Washington or something? I, saw I missed that one. Oh, okay, never mind. I, I'm obviously, my, my, <laughs> part of, my part of Google must find other things that yours part. There was a quote from, I'm sure from Clint Eastwood, but I couldn't find it last night. When he was mayor, of, and I mean Clint Eastwood, the, uh, the actor-director, when he was mayor of Carmel, yes. mm -hmm. and uh, he had this great quote of, if there was a flat rate tax, the IRS could be run with, by a little old lady with a laptop computer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that is a, 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 a great image uh, for all sorts of reasons, but especially the, the level of bureaucracy. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm having a bit of a conflict here be to, because, you know, you are in the depth of the political scene mm -hmm. in Washington, um, and I mean the next bit as a kind of compliment, like an eminence, eminence grise within p pol political areas there. Um, you're in that, but it's not changing the way that you are suggesting it's should change. Can you do more, or what do you need to do to, to get more of things happening the way that you want them to happen? Sure. Uh, step one is uh, we ask all candidates in the United States to sign a pledge to the American people that they'll vote against and oppose any effort to raise taxes. And that's you, that's you as Americans, Americans for, for tax, tax reform. reform. Right. Okay. And uh, good news is we've got a majority of the House of Representatives and almost a majority in the Senate. Uh, and there was a 16-year period in American history where no, there was no tax increase at the national level because we had enough guys taking the, uh, the pledge. And we're back to a House and a Senate committed to never raising taxes. Uh, so step one is don't let things get worse. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think we need to look at dramatically reducing the size and scope of government. And that's not taking some government program and cutting it 10%. It's looking at it and reforming it so that it works better and costs less. Uh, when Bill Clinton signed welfare reform in the United States, we didn't say welfare will be cut 30 or 40 percent. They said, we're going to put out to the 50 states. They'll handle how to do these things. They'll be, uh, they'll be more responsible to the people who are more likely to beat them or not beat them on that subject, rather than be one of 100 topics people discuss in federal politics. Uh, and welfare spending dropped in that program by about 40 percent nationally. It wasn't cut, it was reformed so that it was done better and it cost less. You can reform government to become much smaller a lot easier than you can cut it because when you cut it, you don't know which parts aren't working. Um, you know, you don't lose weight by cutting off the top 10%. Um, you, and you don't want to get the government to become smaller just by arbitrarily saying 
10 percent or even though when you reformed it, you could take it down 40 or 50 percent. You don't say we're going to cut it in half. You say we're going to reform it so that it costs less. And a lot of that is to get government to be more flexible. That, look, technology moves faster than the business community can move, and the business community moves much faster than the political structures uh, can move. You can imagine if uh, technology was only allowed to shift every two or four years, the way we have elections, and tell politicians you can only shift every two or four years. Uh, business community can't, you know, business, whether it's a startup or been around for a while, can't make decisions or change their mind or change directions. Well, we'll change directions in two years or in four years uh, or maybe in eight years. Uh, life moves too quickly. And that's why government setting up rules for a business world uh, that moves faster than it can adapt. And the business community is already lagging because it takes them a while to figure out what technology allows and makes possible. That, that government acts as, as an anchor on technological change because you've got, it's not just that technology can flourish with stupid laws. Technology often doesn't happen with stupid laws. And new businesses can't start up with old laws that seem to make sense in 1930 because they were reacting to problems from 1910. Uh, and now they want everything from labor laws and, and other things to tell people today, well, we think you should work a 40-hour week and only eight hours a day, and, but you got to work five hours a week, and you're going to have one job because that's the way we looked at it in 1910. Uh, and all of the, in the United States and other countries, laws that were structured, and then, and they were catching up then with what they'd already seen happen. Well, luckily, they at least changed the laws from when everybody worked, 70% of people worked on a farm to where seven, you know, more people were working in, in factories. But we don't all work in factories, and we certainly don't all structure our lives that way. But labor laws act as if we did. Uh, and that's where Uber and Airbnb and uh, the whole gig economy, the sharing economy, are running up. Much of what's done is illegal. You know, this idea of permissionless uh, innovation, of just doing it, which is what Uber did, for instance. They just start going. I I'm, live in Washington, D.C. Uber just started up in, in, in Washington. Uh, they have taxi commissions, and they've got government bureaucracies that tell you if you want to drive a car and give somebody a ride and charge them money. We've got a, a lot of rules for you. And Uber said, that's very nice. And they just went ahead. And they ended up getting hundreds of drivers and tens of thousands of customers. And by the time the government bureaucrats figured out what was going on and said, you don't fit in our Procrustean bed over here. You do, you know, what you're doing doesn't fit our rules. So you are going to have to shift and not do all the things that make your consumers happy. Because what has to change is you have to fit our rules. And Uber said, we'll see you. And uh, they suggested that their customers might want to uh, email or phone call, or I guess not fax anymore, um, the, the elected officials in D.C. And they got such pushback that they basically backed off and let Uber function. Then they ran around and ma made some rules to, to fit, they made the rules fit Uber, okay? Not Uber fit the rules. Um, you know, if you're too tall for the Procrustean bed, you don't chop off your feet, you make the bed fit. Uh, but Uber and some of the other the, the business community, you talk about wanting to be a revolutionary, wanting to change things. Uh, if you want to change things in the world, it's much more interesting to start a startup and compete with some sleepy giant which has got laws written which constrict how it behaves, has labor contracts written that have been rewritten and rewritten from the last 30 years, so all the structure on how and what people can do is limited. Uh, Competing with somebody who's basically stapled down to the mat and can't catch up with you is, is the best way to get rich. Um, but it's also the way to do things that can't be done presently. Uh, countries change a lot more with technology in the hands of entrepreneurs that do startups that disrupt the guilds, the unions, the laws that tell everyone, we've always done it this way, or at least always for 50 years, um, and sweeping that aside by replacing it. And now taxi cab companies and taxi lawmakers 
are beginning to act more like Uber. The taxi cabs in D.C. are cleaner, nicer. They take credit cards now. I mean, they only in the last few years decided to take credit cards. Um, you know, they, were, they didn't have to because the laws didn't let anyone compete with them. One of the topics I mentioned this morning uh, in the beginning, and um, I'm glad you mentioned Uber because uh, I got an Uber from the airport on whichever day I arrived. A uh, nice lady came with a nice car. And um, my issue, though, is this is called the sharing economy. And, okay, I guess I was sharing her car, but I was actually paying somebody for her yeah. car. So, you know, is, is Uber, you know, these great headlines of Uber is the biggest taxi company in the world without a, a taxi car and uh, Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain without actually owning a room. But now we've got Uber, I read, I think, last night that Uber is now offering effectively subprime leasing uh, de deals to get people to be Uber drivers by lending them money at a super cheap rate. Now, you know, because it all sounds kind of... people who didn't yet have a car. Yeah, but yeah. Um, what's the... Is that really the sharing economy or is that just a way for Uber, the platform, and we know actually anybody in tech making a platform, once you've got the platform right, it's very, very easy, uh, well, it's quite easy to scale it. Is it just not a way for Uber to be another type of business to make money? Is it really that sharing economy? Well, I'm not quite sure I, when people talk about the sharing economy, um, when you go out to Burning Man, everyone says it's all a gift economy. No, it's everybody brings their own stuff and runs their own <laughs> lives, and sometimes they give gifts to each other. But it's not, you know, it's, it's not required to do gifts. You bring your own stuff. You set up your own shop. Um, you bring your own food, and there's a bunch of sharing and gifting that goes along with that. So I'm not quite sure sharing's not the quite word. What it is is a more, in strictly economic terms, they're using unused, or not dead capital, but unused capital. You have a car and you don't drive it very often. I mean, most cars sit in garages most times. Uh, people have gone beyond uh, oh. Uber to rental cars where they put an attachment on your car and somebody can come by and, with your permission, click through your car, drive your car around for X number of hours on a weekend or a day, because you've just got to park there, you drive to work, and then you drive back. Uh, so that capital the cap of the car is better used. Uh, both that, that I get. I mean, I've, yeah. I've signed up for something like that in the UK because when my car is there, it sits there and does nothing. But that is much more of a sharing economy. But, I mean, is, is Uber really sharing economy or is it just another way of making money? Well, in which Uber case, if it is a, make, a way of making money, yeah. and certainly we had the, the politicians here until extremely recently uh, suggesting it may not be allowed here. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, with the big EU with their stick have come down and said, no, all the EU countries must allow situations and companies like that. As, and here we've got the situation now. Well, of course, we welcome them, but they must pay the taxes. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit lost in maybe it's a labeling thing, which is why mm. I mentioned the topic at the beginning. Yeah. But is Uber not just another way of making money for Uber, and therefore it does need some sort of more traditional regulation to fit it into the way we receive taxes? I know you don't like mm. people paying taxes too much, but just a little bit. Um, sharing economy, gig economy, in the United States, it's called the 1099 because your your income it doesn't come from a company; it comes from your clients. The people. Uh -huh. uh, so, you're an independent contractor, uh, and you're an entrepreneur. Okay. What we've done with what Uber's done is it says we've got one piece of business, which is we will sell you information on who wants a ride, right, and put you in touch with them, and then you make money servicing that customer. Uh, same thing with Airbnb and then there are others where you rent your, your boat out and if you ever look, go out and look at uh, uh, areas where, where, where boats are stored, you see even on good days, you know, most yeah. of the boats are still sure. there. Uh, and now in the States people are renting those out more easily uh, with something like Airbnb but with, with a boat. Uh, you're using capital more effectively, using people's time more effectively. Uh, you're, cr you're making making. You are allowing people to be entrepreneurs. When you talk to Uber drivers, to Airbnb, these are almost two-thirds of Uber drivers do something else, too. Uh, and so this is a second job where they're an entrepreneur. They may have a traditional job with a boss, uh, but this allows you to be your own boss. And 
so many of our labor laws and labor union rules and, and other structures, uh, tax collectors like to have an easy place to collect taxes. That's why they like the company, if you work for a company, they withhold your taxes because it's easier to talk to IBM about everybody who works for IBM than to chase after everybody individually and withhold your taxes uh, that way. So the government likes you to have a boss because you're easier to tax. The labor unions want you to have a boss so you can pay union dues. Uh, and a lot of people would rather be self-employed uh, at least part of the time, at least part of what they do. I think that Uber, Airbnb, the gig economy, um, independent contractor economy, the 1099 economy, whatever you want to call it, it gives more people more freedom to do what they want. And the old laws that we built up during a time when everybody had a boss and you had to have a boss and you couldn't imagine not having a boss, um, I mean, it's like people who couldn't imagine not having a prince or a king. You can do without them. You really can. Um, you don't have to have that structure, even though for hundreds and thousands of years we thought you did. Chubba, and we Chubba organize Man life around that. Chubba mentioned just before some um, science fiction examples of different types of governments and things. I mean, how the, the, the sheer nature of the size of states being, I don't mean the United States, but yeah. states in general, mm -hmm. being generally so big, how do we change it then? I mean, what, do, what needs to be done? Okay, you're in there yeah. fighting away. What needs to change? How does it change? I'm working on it inside the system, trying to change uh, the rules to make it easier for people to be self-employed and, and not to have taxes on self-employment as high as they are, uh, to make it easier for people to just work in general, have generally lower taxes and more uh, opportunities to do what they want to do uh, with how they organize their life. There are entrepreneurs in the business committee who'd look you in the eye and say, I'm not political. The guys who work at Uber tell you they're not political. But they play more uh, tougher with the government than perhaps I do as a, as a taxpayer political activist. I mean, Uber got set up in Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. The government sent people out with those little ski masks that, that, that bank robbers and terrorists wear, okay, and would lure somebody in, pretending they want an Uber, and then when they um, you know, suggested that they'd give you a ride for money, uh, as the town would legalize prostitution but not legalize car <laughs> rentals, uh, the guy with the mask would jump you. Okay? And there are pictures of this going on. And at the end of the day, the state passed a law that forbade local government from behaving like that and legalized uh, the gig economy in the state. Arizona reacting to efforts by local governments to ban Airbnb. You can't do that. You might just, you know, your, your neighbors might object. My house. Now, if you want a, a noise ordinance or something, that's fine. But, but don't tell me I can't have friends over to my house that either pay or don't pay. It's up, up to me. It's my house. I pay my property taxes. Back off. Uh, and the state of Arizona passed a law. It says, okay, local government, back off. We're gonna, this will be legal to have people stay at your house for vacation or for pay. Up to you. Your business. Uh, by doing things and explaining that there's a constituency for it, by creating tens and hundreds of thousands of people who are making a living uh, doing Uber and Airbnb, and all the guys who sell on eBay. Um, uh, all of this has created a constituency for more liberty, which then shows up in politicians deciding to have a little lighter hand on some of their regs on newer industries. But when the, in the United States, when email started up, the post office had a solution. What you're going to do, if they first started, they first said this with faxes, but then they came back and said it with email. What you're going to do is send your fax to the post office. Then the post office will fax it to another post office, and then people can come pick it up there. That's what they thought would be a good idea. They actually said the same thing on email. I thought it was a joke when they did, but they, they were trying, how do we get in on, yeah. well, there's no you in email. There's no post office in email. There's no post office in fax. This is around what you're doing. Uh, and the guys I talked to in Silicon Valley world in, in, in the States, uh, not just Silicon Valley, but uh, say, you want to get rich? Find out something the government's doing or an industry that's very heavily unionized and therefore has all these work rules 
that everybody has to work towards and figure out how to do that outside the old structure because they're too big and fat and, and, and legally or contractually banned from doing all the things that you'd never do if you were starting it today with today's technology. But isn't that exactly what you should be doing because you are in the middle of a big situation that's seemingly working but not working, not open. I mean, when now we have blockchain, we have smart contracts, when we have Estonia offering you know, e-citizenship, we have Estonia offering country of a ser as a service. Um, you know, democracy, if you Google or even you other, other websites are available, when you Google democracy, it is government of the people, by the people, or for the people, and all the variations of that. Um, you know, we don't have, I mean, to me, democracy is not the 1.1 million out of 9 million people voting for a new mayor. That doesn't seem to be that particularly fair either. My own contrary argument to that, which now can be done with technology, where it, years, uh, 1970, there was a movie, and I checked today, it wasn't actually released in the States, I have no idea why. It was called The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer. And it was done by some, um, at the time, the most famous British comedians. So if you see it, and you, you recognize some people from Monty Python, it's a smart satire, actually conceived by David Frost, who you've probably heard of mm -hmm. from the Nixon interview. Yeah. And basically, an advertising guy, a PR guy, becomes prime minister and effectively becomes a dictator of the United Kingdom. Now we have an advertising guy who's prime minister in the UK, uh, probably from June, he may not be, but that's another issue. But the thing is that they, he instituted this, um, this situation there, and this was, say, 1970, so a while back, though we do remember it, don't we, whereby all the citizens could vote on every topic. And of course, in those days, in the time you were just describing, I mean, even pre-fax, it meant that the country ground to a halt because every day, every people, every person would get a ton of post because mm -hmm. they'd have to open it, read it, and vote on those particular topics. And of course, everybody said, we don't want that. And yes, okay, Prime Minister, you're doing the right thing, and off you go. But now we actually have the technology to achieve that, mm -hmm. to actually have people with a bigger engagement. And, and for me, the issue with democracy as kind of democracy is right now mm -hmm. is that it's not as engaging for people as it should be. So if that were the case and other people agreed with that and we have the technology, then can't you actually in your very influential mm -hmm. position, instead of, as I must admit, in other situations, I would try and change things from the outside. Why is there not? I mean, is Estonia going to disrupt government and countries? I mean, why not? All the other things are being disrupted with technology. No, they should. And government should have to compete the way any business does to provide the best service at the lowest cost. One of the advantages of federalism in Switzerland or the United States or other places is uh, there are at least 50 states. And some of them are doing something smarter than others. They could learn from each other. You can actually pick up and move if you've decided that your state's hopeless uh, and it, it won't function the way you do. But I think we found over time that government, and whether, it's, whether we choose our king by electing him or because he's related to the previous king, he's still a government guy making certain decisions about your life. And the fewer decisions the king or the president or the prime minister make, the better off we are. Um, we're in Hungary right now. Uh, at one point, governments thought that everybody in a certain land had, the same, had to have the same religion as the prince, right? The, uh, the, that the prince would decide what, whether we're all Protestants or Calvinists or, or Roman Catholics, and then they would busy kill each other over this topic. And then at some point they decide, you know what? The king isn't going to make that decision for everybody else. Just everyone will make their own decision. There's no, well, shouldn't we vote? No, no voting, no king. You make the decision. And as we make more decisions and put up, what's the, what's the right price for riding in a taxi cab? There's no right price. You'll have many different competing companies offering different prices, and you decide what you're willing to deal with or not deal with. And you, you can't set up a taxi cab commission to come up with the right prices for taxis on Friday night, uh, which is why you have that interesting, you know, Lyft and, and uh, Uber come up with different prices at different time in order to get more drivers out to where people are. If people don't like the surge price, they wait. Um, 
So what you want is fewer decisions made by other people. This is all called growing up and leaving home. Hi, mom, dad, you're out of this now. You're not part of this decision-making process. I'm doing this over here. Uh, mom and dad didn't offer to let you vote in the future. You just do what we want. Uh, now we're going away. And we want the government to decide to back off on more topics. Uh, just American history. Getting out the dead hand of government off long after you've decided it doesn't make any sense. For 100 years, the government set the prices on railroads. If you're going to ride a railroad car from here to here in the United States, here's the price. The North used it to screw the South in order to, 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 to raise prices for them, and, and then politicians would use it to, well, I, I want grain prices to be lower than other prices because I grow grain in my state, and they completely politicized the whole thing. And in the late 1970s, early 1980s, on a bipartisan basis, Carter and then Reagan said, you know all this complicated rulemaking we have for deciding the right price for a train shipping from one? We're not going to have any. There's no right price. Do it yourself. Same thing with airlines. Um, airlines uh, used to have 10% of the people who had flown, then shortly, very quickly, half the people had flown because the government wasn't going to set any airline prices. They used to set every single one of them. And then trucking, the same thing. For 50 years, trucks and airlines had their prices regulated. They said, out of here. We're out of that decision-making process. So, but why did it take 100 years on trains and 50 on the other to decide this is wrong, it's becoming corrupted? First of all, there is no right train price. And by the way, and when you do have one, it changes so much quicker than any committee could ever get, you know, you know we're going to drop the price 5%. No, up 5%. No committee is going to be able to do that. Imagine um, a little old lady getting off a plane, though. She's got a ton of bags. It's raining, with, you know, chucking it down with rain. And she has her whatever, $20 in the local currency. Um, but the surge pricing is now 100 Where's the protection from her? Doesn't some government give some sort of protection? I mean, how, how you know, you could end up with a real life and death situation just because of a surge pricing. I mean, how, okay, I know life's not fair, but how does that fit in? Well, because if you didn't have surge pricing, the little old lady would die waiting for a taxi that wasn't there because the price wasn't enough to get a taxi driver out of bed to be there. But I mean, we, we, we know what that is. I mean, there's, we just went through this in New York. New York, the governor, mayor of New York, de Blasio, uh, was going to uh, cap the number of Ubers and only allow it to grow 1% a year. And we have as many taxi cab medallions as we did 50 years ago, actually less than we did 50 years ago, which keeps the taxi cabs down, which means if you're in Manhattan, you can get a taxi. If you're in Queens or, Brook or uh, uh, Bronx or Brooklyn or the outer boroughs, you can't. Uh, when Uber came in, where did we see? It was the poorer, er poorer and further out areas that were not served at all. Talk about the little old lady who dies of a heart attack waiting for a cab that will not go to to Queens. That's not a maybe story. That's a real story. And it happened because the goddamn stupid government decided they were going to set the number of people driving uh, cars and the price. And people died as a result. Okay? You, you have much, if you have much more flexibility, you have much less problem and you let people make these decisions for themselves. And as the government backs off of these decisions on you know, the idea of voting on everything, we don't vote on whether you go to church or not or what church you go to. We don't vote on what you have for breakfast. We don't, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of things that the government isn't involved in. They're constantly trying to, like the, 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 the land shark in Saturday Night Live, they're always knocking on the door. Oh, we need to help your health. Oh, we need to protect this out or the other thing. All they want is in to eat you. I mean, they want your tax money, they want to run your life, and they got a series of reasons why they need to run your life. They never have any reasons about why they don't need to run your life. The government never knocks on your door and says, we used to do this, but we're not going to do that anymore. You're, you're allowed to make your own decision. They have to be pushed into those all the time. This is why we chop the heads off kings. I mean, the, the, the back off. We'll make our decisions in this zone. Wasn't and this is, why this is why the whole thing that we're focused on in terms of technology and the gig economy and, and entrepreneurship people creating new freedoms and new opportunities, being an Uber driver, renting your house through Airbnb, just wasn't technologically possibly done. Still illegal in many of the places that, it, that it's been done. And these whole political movements flow out of somebody doing something that's not legal for the first time, uh, homeschooling 
smoking marijuana in the United States. There are two million, several, two million people homeschooled now. Two million kids are homeschooled. It was illegal in all 50 states. While it was illegal, people started doing it, got to be enough of them. The government said, okay, okay, we're out of here. And the same thing's happening state by state on marijuana. Um, so people uh, are making their own decisions. The government's going, this is not something we're going to tell you what to do. There's a long list of things that the government is busy telling you what to do that they ought not. Wasn't it Ronald Reagan who said the most scary words possible is somebody knocking on the door and saying, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help? Yes. I think he was, yes. okay. That's right. Because they never go away. We've got uh, seven minutes, and we would like some questions, yeah? Yes, I'm yes, sure. Yes. I mean, we've spoken before. I think we, we could talk all night, because um, we see a lot of things similarly, a lot of things differently. Uh, we've got runners with mics somewhere. And can we have the high, light, lights up? And we will happily take some questions. Make use of the chance to speak to Grover. Any mics? Go on. If you tell me and I'll okay. shout it out. How do, you, how do you decide what, you mean what, what type of government or what, the size of, yeah. 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 What should government be? Well, um, are you willing to shoot the guy if he doesn't do what you tell him to? And if the answer to that's no, then the government ought not to be doing it. Because at the end of the day, the government comes in and says, you have to do it our way. And they says, no, I don't want to do that. Then they show up and they take you away. And if you don't want to go with them, the guns come out. The, are you willing to use that much force? The, I mean, it's not a joke. The guy in New York who was killed selling a single cigarette. I mean, you heard about, this, heard about the guy, right? They got the cops wrestled him to the ground. He said, I'm having trouble breathing. He died, OK? And everyone talked about police brutality. Well, yeah, but why were the police arresting him? Why were they on top of him? Because he was selling a single cigarette, which in New York State is illegal, because some idiot decided that it ought to be illegal for some stupid reason, maybe a good reason. But what they did say is, if you don't stop selling a single cigarette when we tell you to, we will kill you, OK? And, and they did, and the cops didn't, you know, the guy's dead. Um, if you're not willing to say that, you know, we're going we're to have enough taxes to defend the country against the Canadians invading. Okay, that's important. They we're going to have to have that because uh, you got to keep an eye on them. They, they, they sneak over the border, stuff like that. Um, they, they make this stuff they call Canadian bacon. Um, you know, just go watch. Canadian football. I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems we have. But so, so we have to have an army and keep the Canadians on their side of the border. After that, it's not a very large list of things that you're really willing to say, you know, if you work as a Uber driver in a state that hasn't yet passed laws saying that that's OK, are you really have, willing to have the guy with the ski mask on wrestle people to the ground? And, and, and the answer on that is on Uber drivers and stuff, no. And just go through the list. If you're not really willing to have guys show up with guns to tell you you have to do it, then the law is probably not a good law. And it should be a suggestion or something people argue at church that you should do, not something that people with guns show up and tell you you have to do it. That's the first cutoff point. Are you really willing to shoot the guy if he doesn't do it the way you want him to? And if you're not, that's not really a law, is it? Because you just ignore it we, until the um, guys with guns show up. We've I, Something I just thought of from earlier on, that I mean, certainly uh, in the UK press, I, and it, a point you mentioned is actually really worth uh, reminding people that we forget, because a lot of the press is about America, when it actually is a set of states with a, a lot of set of rules. And I, I, that's an important thing, um, I think, sometimes worth remembering to people. But just about, partially to answer uh, your point, that uh, you know, we have speed limits on motorways, generally. I mean, even, even in Germany, there's some places where there's speed limits. And in the UK, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly the statistics, but my anecdotal uh, evidence is everybody is straight up to that 70 mile an hour limit and probably creeping over. Because I think that's actually human nature. I think it's the same with the financial crisis. We had again, sorry to speak just about the UK, it's where I have more experience. And in the financial markets, we had this loose set of self uh, regulation, self-government by the finance industry, and there were some rules in place. So what happened? It was right up to the top of the rules, and 
you know, there needs to be some kind of framework because human nature is, is such that we push it and we push it and we push it and we push it to the limit. Mm -hmm. And I think partially trying to answer you but also trying to get my head around the whole thing as well is it is a big issue in itself about what should be, and I hate even, I can't believe I'm saying this word, regulated, mm -hmm. but which should have some set of rules in place. Uh, it is a massive question. I, I don't know if we'll ever, like uh, Chaba said earlier, it's probably one of those questions we'll never really be able to, to get right. Um, I think perhaps from... You can just check with me. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. one, get rid of it. Pollution. Mm -hmm. Pollution. So should governments, should the EU, whatever, say how, much, uh, chemi how many chemicals or whatever can a big chemical plant dump into a river? Mm -hmm. Is that a government type? regulation because that's common sense mm -hmm. that we should not do pollution especially like active pollution like I've built this factory I'm dumping a ton of red mud into a particular river that's common sense you should not do it mm -hmm. but hey my shareholders need a better return on uh, sure. capital whatever so I have to do that and maybe nobody will notice because there's no rule against it so I can't be hurt so I mean how does that fit in well th there certainly are I mean you have tort law and, and common law toward against somebody who dumps garbage on your property or um, in, in a river from which you drink down downstream. Uh, and you have all sorts of rules, contracts people have come up about not polluting upstream from, from rivers. Uh, but most pollution is a byproduct of what you're doing and most waste is. And all efforts to make the economy more efficient reduce the amount of waste that, that exists, period. So it, there's a lot of progress that can be done. I mean, pollution is waste. Uh, and when you look at the more capitalist society is, the less polluted it ends up than stuff behind the Iron Curtain was, or uh, the more status societies, where you don't have property rights, and they do drop stuff anywhere and, and everywhere. Um, so who makes the property love, rights? I mean, Love Canal in the United States was the federal government polluting, not some private company. OK. OK. Um, we got the mics? Yeah? Okay, so uh, more questions, please. Whoever you can get to first. There's a gentleman down there. And if one of you want to go a few rows back, there's a front. You are waving. It's one of those you're waving, you're not drowning. Yeah, okay, good. There's okay. three ladies back there who are very keen to pose some questions. Uh, so I have a bit of a combined question uh, because I thought the definition of anarchy was the absence of hierarchies. But if it's still in a capitalist society, uh, the Capitalism enforces these hierarchies, uh, not by the government, but by, by money. And the people get pushed lower, people get pushed higher, and, and, it's, um, and hierarchies uh, get made. And also, I don't really understand why anarchy and democracy is being contrasted in, in these votes, because I thought anarchy was um, the ultimate form of democracy, a direct democracy, which is, uh, and uh, it's, I don't understand why it's being contrasted. Well, yeah. Anarchy is interesting because I remember the anarchists in Spain that wanted to ban coffee. Um, and I was like, how does that work? Who's going to ban coffee if we're an anarchist? Sometimes people say anarchists when they don't quite mean it. Anarchy meaning by definition the lack of, of a government. Um, and a government is the legal monopoly on force. And it could be for a very limited number of things. Don't kill people or we'll get mad at you. Don't invade our country or we'll get mad at you. Uh, or the legal monopoly on force can decide to arrest you because you sell a single cigarette and they don't like that. Um, so the question is how much, if you have a legal monopoly on force, I mean the government's allowed to come and use force against you under certain circumstances, how many circumstances? My argument is it should be a small number of circumstances and it should be a smaller list than we have today uh, uh, in the United States or in any country uh, in the world. Uh, Libertarianism is generally thought of as here's we, we protect your property, we protect your life, we enforce contracts, and then we go to bed at five o'clock and we don't feel we have to fill the rest of our day screwing with your life. Um, so we'll do those things and you do everything else. Uh, and, but democracy or monarchy or dictatorship, you know, uh, military dictatorship, all those things just decide who you decide who runs the government, not what the government does. You could theoretically have a king that, who leaves people alone. 
the reason we ended up with representative government, not, it's not democracy, the democratically elected representatives who then screw us, uh, is that we found that less repulsive than kings over time. And, and uh, you know, Caesar kept forgetting to have kids, and the king, you know, Henry VIII kept forgetting to have kings, and so you have these wars uh, that, that, that made democracy a better way to shift from one leader, elected representative government, a better way to shift from one leader to another because wars are unhealthy for people, and it's very expensive, and it's a mess, and it, it costs a lot in terms of human lives and suffering. And so that was pretty brutal. So you were trying to avoid that. But the idea that democracy, democratically electing your leaders, means all your leaders are really smart and clever, okay, make a list of the ones you can think of, okay? Did you get the smartest, cleverest people? Did you get people with the best um, intentions? Did you give them people who can competently do what they were planning um, to do? Uh, I don't think they should do anything until they fix the potholes. Then they can come tell me, you know, other things, how to run my life. You know, get the little things done first. So democracy, representative government, is simply picking the transition between leaders in a less bloody, destructive way than kings who forget to have the right number of sons. I think the, uh, the, the super short answer to your question is what I began the day briefly talking about is these are labels, and perhaps some of these labels need to be revisited because on, we know on a lot of points, I mean a huge number of points, shouldn't say this here, we're actually in absolute agreement, but the point is though, my point is, dom is democracy, mm -hmm. democracy. Well, the West often makes the mistake of saying we're for democracy when what we mean is we're for separation of church and state and we're for people being allowed to own their own houses and their own property and make their own decisions and freedom of speech and all these other things that we, when we say democracy, we mean a whole list of freedoms that are outside the, the democratic government sphere. You know, what you read, what you believe religiously, it is outside that sphere. It's not doesn't get to be chosen by kings or people we elect or select men or anything. Okay, but we go to, to uh, the, the the guys in Zimbabwe and said, you know, if you had elections, you'd be rich. They had elections and they weren't didn't get rich. You know, it, it didn't. It's not what, what you needed. They needed property rights. They needed freedom of association, freedom of speech, and the fact that they elected a guy who was destructive is didn't make it any better. But having a vote doesn't make you rich, successful, happy, or give you the freedoms that people think of when they look at democratic Western governments and say those people are reasonably free. It's not because we elect our guys that were reasonably free. We started electing people after we were free. Who else has got the mic? Thanks for the question. Uh, sorry, do you want to make a comment, please? OK, OK. Um, who's got the, uh, yeah, lady there. My question is, you were already talking before about technological advancement and how that impacts voting and public uh, participation in voting. Uh, but at the same time, issues are becoming more and more complex. So don't you see it as an issue that a lot of people will just go with their gut feeling rather than taking an educated decision? You're talking about individuals make their own decisions? So you say, uh, with, okay, if we have the technological advances yeah. to make more people able to vote, I'm, not, I'm sure you did understand oh, the question, oh. but then, then we've got the question of actually getting the, the issues explained to them. Is that what you meant? And I think blockchain before. Yeah. And I think there is that idea out there of having, using blockchain to, for voting, and then you could increase the number like, of engagement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. at the same time, I have the feeling that a lot of people are overwhelmed with the topics that are actually discussed. So it comes back to education. Yeah. It's another one of my big topics. But look, yeah. again, there are two buckets. One is things that are your decision and no government tells you what to do in that zone. Okay? Then there's how we choose the guys who run the government. Okay? Those are two different containers. And we could work on improving elections and making it easier for people to get to the polls or to make it easier for them to know more information about the candidates, putting information on the candidates online and so on, debates and whatnot. Those all get you a better informed electorate. But if a politician is going to make decisions about a thousand things in your life, there's no way that when you say to him, I choose you because you seem like a good guy, even a good guy cannot intelligently make a thousand decisions. He subcontracts that down to some bureaucrat 
in, in a basement somewhere and they make decisions about your life. My argument is very few things should be decided in your life by politicians and the government. You should make those decisions because you're the only one with the, the right amount of information about you. You may want more, okay, you want to read books on health and maybe I should be eating more of this and leaving that. There are lots of people making books like that and their television shows and their radio shows and the thing is full of information and if the government comes in and decides this is the right answer, first of all, they always get it wrong um, or, you know, over time, the government ought not to be making those decisions at all. And the more decisions the government makes, even if you elect people, even if you know, the, 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 the saints come down and pick them for you, they can't possibly be making the right decisions for you, which is what we're, dis we're, dis we're learning about in medicine. I mean, there are a lot of medicines that, that work for some people and don't, and the government says, this medicine's bad for some people, so it's banned. Well, save some other people's lives. We, we need to look at some of this on a more individual basis than yes, uh, no. And one of the things that's interesting in the States is we've got a right to try movement, which I would recommend other places, our FDA, Food and Drug Administration, which is going to save us all by telling us what we can and can't eat, um, doesn't allow you to sell drugs, pharmaceuticals, until they've been ruled safe and effective. Okay? And the right to try is 29 states have passed laws that says, in our state, we say it's legal to use any drug that's safe, and we're not going to wait for the federal government, FDA, to do five more years testing to say it's effective, for specifically on things diseases that will kill you. Because we don't have, Mary doesn't have time to wait five years for you to decide it's effective. As long as it's safe, it's not gonna kill her faster than what she has, we say it's legal. Now, the federal government says it's illegal, just like our marijuana laws in Colorado. They say it's legal, the feds say it's illegal, the feds have backed off. The feds are backing off on the FDA and saying, we will let people with terminal diseases make decisions for themselves. Someday they'll treat us all like grown-ups, but for starters, they're treating people who are dying like grown-ups and say you can make these decisions. Well, you're not meaning, though, as well, that you are concerned, I was talking earlier about the percentage of engagement, that if people get overwhelmed with the complexity of issues, they just won't be involved? Was, was that what you were meaning? If you're not really familiar with a topic, yeah. um, it takes quite, like, I know that from my I own voting process, it takes quite a lot of time and effort to properly get educated about an issue and then decide on it. And I, I think, like, the chances that most people will actually take that time and effort are quite low. Okay, I think it's back to the engagement process again. Um, I'm sorry, we are absolutely bang on running out of time. I'm really sorry. There I, are we four zeros there. We got time. Four zeros, yeah. Okay, it was the jackpot or something. We didn't get the, uh, the apples and things. Um, I, we could go on all day because whenever we talk, we, we go on for a long time. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Grover's come from the heart of the democratic place of Washington to be here yeah, for you. Heart of statism. Yeah, okay. So please, uh, I was just here to provoke some things from him. I hope that worked. Uh, please give a massive thank you for Grover Norquist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.